Welcome everyone to the X Umbras podcast. Uh, Scholar McClarney, and with me is Schoolman Fawcett, and we are teachers at the world's only online Chesterton Academy, the Chesterton Academy of San Isidore Learning Center. Dr. McClarney is the headmaster, and we both teach uh, humanities. And if you'd like to know uh, what uh, a typical class might be like, uh, that's what this podcast is for in a lot of ways. This is uh, classical Catholic education in podcast format. And today we're going to talk about a source text for a lot of cl- uh, classical Catholic education in a lot of ways. One of the most important uh, of the texts uh, is called On the Reduction of the Arts to Theology by St. Bonaventure. Dr. McClarney, what can you tell me about St. Bonaventure? Never heard of him before. All right. Um, so, <laughs> never heard of the speech before. I didn't realize it was the most important document. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. It's it certainly, it's a... Uh, no pun intended, but it's integral to the history Ooh, of the Catholic yes. education. I, I have called Bonaventure the father of Catholic academic integration. And, and that term, it's used. there's different terms that are used for what goes on in Catholic schools. Yep. Sometimes you hear it called permeation. Uh, that's what it's called in the Edmonton Catholic School District, yep. uh, which, which you used to work for, I believe. Uh, here in our district and in a lot of places in the United States, it's called integration. Right. Uh, in our school district, Elk Island Catholic Schools, that's, what, that's what's favored. Uh, so I, w- I have referred to Bonaventure as the father of permeation or the father of integration. Right. You can see Augustine as laying a lot of the foundation for this. Oh, absolutely. Okay. But and Augustine's writing in a context where, uh, well, so for example, his, uh, you've, you're an Augustine expert. You've probably come across uh, on Christian doctrine. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, and in that one, that's one of the questions that comes up is uh, what, yeah. you know, and of course this is still a, uh, mo- much like Scotland in Macbeth, it's a somewhere between pagan yes. and Christian in this yeah, world, right? That's right. And the yeah. uh, learning is mostly still in, in pagan authors. And right. parents are asking Augustine, should we offer this education to our children? Since it's all pagan, right? The classical education is a pagan education. And uh, Augustine says something like, I mean, you can kind of correct me if you think I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but sure. basically like, Yes, but you because we're, we can steal the gold of the Egyptians, right? Yes. Israel, on its way Plunder. out of Egypt, plundered the gold of the yeah, Egyptians. That's, right. that's what we're doing with the pagans. We're taking their gold, all their good stuff, and claiming it for Christ, for who it rightly belongs. So yep. uh, allow them to have this education, but you know, supplement it with a, a solid catechesis. Right? All right. I mean, maybe one, one day, perhaps, we can really have a whole, uh, you know, this will all be comfortably within the Christian sphere. Right. Yeah. Is that a fair summary, would you say, of Augustine's yeah, approach towards I, I think, and he, the, Augustine's not the only one who was classically trained uh, in in the pagan world. Uh, Jerome would be another good example. Well, I mean, there's lots, but that, another good example, Chrysostom. It just goes on and on the list. Yeah. Uh, but the general tendency is to say, well, there's some good things we can gather from them, but we're going to leave them behind. Yeah. Right. So we're going to move beyond them. Uh, now there, there's a bit of back and forth on that. I mean, Saint Jerome famously has that uh, that telling dream where he's accused of being a Ciceronian and not a Christian, uh, and so mm-hmm. abandons all his um, books of Cicero. Um, and then later on, when someone finds him, you know, reading Cicero again, mm-hmm. as well, it was just a dream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, you can see the, the the back and forth and. Uh, but there's a sense, yes, we are going to take what is true, what is good, and and that, that goes uh, even earlier, uh, much earlier, uh, to um, the apologists like Saint mm-hmm. Justin Martyr. It would be a good example where he sees the um, the semina uh, loga, right, or the rationa, I'm using yeah. Latin or Greek there, but the seeds of the word, mm-hmm. right, have been and the uh, word being like the word, the governing logic behind the universe, the second person of the Trinity, that ex- seeds of yes, that word, yeah, exactly, have have been implanted in the creation and people as well, mm-hmm. and so there can be truth and goodness found in Plato, who would be a good example. Right, yes. uh, and, and and thinkers, and so um, it's there is it's worthwhile, uh, it's worth our attention, certainly. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. And that was so that's the feeling of the of the I guess early church, the patristic era, uh, and then you know, the patristic era more or less comes to an end with the birth of the medieval era, right? You could say Boethius is the first medieval, right? Okay. Of course, he's uh, father of a lot of classical Catholic education, right? We've mentioned before he wrote books on music, and of course the Constellation of Philosophy, which was. Every educated person read the Consolation of Philosophy. And then, in the uh, wake of the pagan world, you have Christendom. 
and yeah. an education develops within Christendom. And, you know, not to go into the whole story, but you have cathedral schools, you have the monasteries, and that's yes. really where most learning is happening. And yep. it is primarily theology. Right. And it's reflected in the theology of the time. You, you can read someone like Anselm, right? right? And he's reasoning in a certain way. I mean, his ontological argument is in the form of a prayer, right? That's, right. that's yeah. the, it's, it's in a monastic context, really. Yeah. Uh, and that's what learning looks like. But and it has to be said, um, Plato was very much vindicated, largely by like Augustine, right? Yes. So yeah. uh, Plato's philosophy is certainly used, although I don't think they had access to that much of Plato's well, writings per it's, se. It's, yeah, it's I a mean, very baptized. It is very baptized. Of, uh, so Plato. a good example would be like in Augustine's Confessions, when uh, the books of the Platonists arrive on his doorstep and essentially rescue him from Manichaeanism, yeah. and this important stepping stone and when Augustine explains what he read in there he says well what I read when I opened the books of the Plainness I learned that in the beginning was the word and the words with God and the word was God mm, <laughs> and, so, sure. and nothing came to creation except what came through the word so basically he's quoting for us the opening of John's gospel sure. uh, and scholars are like okay what did you like what and so the, it, this is Augustine explaining uh, his way of uh, conveying that mm. all that uh, it was good, true, and beautiful in Plato is subsumed in, in yeah. the work, right? And we see this in, in the prologue of sure, John, yeah. for example. Well, I mean, Augustine, reckon, you can you say he either makes Plato into a Christian before Christ, or you could say he recognizes Socrates and Plato as being kind of Christians before Christ. Uh, yeah. Well, he's going to criticize them. He's going to say sure, yeah. they knew where they wanted to go. So they exactly, wanted yeah. to go to the one. They just didn't know how to get sure. there. So what they were missing was the way. Sure. So uh, had, who is the truth? Yeah, Augustine yeah. says something like, had Plato been around now, he'd be a Christian. He's just something oh. to that effect, right, at one point. So, uh, yeah. and I mean, again, we, there's uh, expositors like A.J.P. Taylor or George Grant who, uh, who uh, teach Plato from a, uh, an Anglican perspective, and they're accused of making Plato into a Christian before Christ. But regardless, a baptized version of Platonism, roughly you could say, uh, was the predominant philosophy of early Christendom. Uh, yeah. And it was mainly, uh, you know, theology, and of course philosophy understood through theology was what was mainly taught. Uh, and then there's a, uh, there's a lot of changes that happened, you could say, at around the 13th century. Uh, three major ones that are all closely related are... Yep. The, the rise of the universities. Right. right. There's a move from the monastic tradition into the universities, which are actually mainly like the teachers of the cathedral school forming their own kind of guilds, right? And uh, giving each other licenses to teach and then getting kind of recognized by civic governments and ultimately by the Pope. Uh, right. and the Pope gave recognition to the University of Paris in 1215. Very okay. important year, also the year of the Magna Carta, also the year of the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215. Right. But... Uh, so there's the change from the monasteries to the universities, and with that, a corresponding change in method. Uh, okay. Uh, Jacques Maritain once said, scholasticism is actually the first technique or the first technology in mm. the West, because, again, you go from Anselm and that kind of, or, or Augustine, right? You know, the way Augustine reasons, right? It's very prayerful, it's biographical, where it shifts into this uh, format, Right, hmm. the question and answer format, the yeah. dialogical format that you see, dialectical format that you see in like Aquinas. Right. The Summa. Well, okay, I might have some reservations with all respect to Maritime there, but uh, sure, I, 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 okay, this is an overview. Sure, sure, sure. I, yeah, okay, and okay. That may be, but but it's it's undeniable that there is a shift, and that's recognized by some as being a problem, both at the time and okay. today. Right, it's yeah. like uh, you're separating theology from its lived context in the monasteries and so forth and making it into sort of an academic thing, right? right. This, is a, yep. this is a critique now. It was sort of recognized as being a problem. Yep. Then you can see it in something like um, The Imitation of Christ, mm. right? Uh, which has a lot of great stuff in it, but there's yep. that element of almost anti-intellectualism, right? Especially, I think the first meditation says, uh, you know, on Judgment Day, you will not be asked what you have read, but what you have done. Right. Right. <laughs> there's, so there's, yeah. there's that element that's already going on there. Another big thing that's very closely related is the rise of the mendicant orders, right? Right. Where you have the Benedictines who are sedentary or, or like they're grounded in the one place. Yep. Uh, and then, they're, then there's this new orders that are uh, moving around on foot oh, and yeah. uh, they're, they're dedicated explicitly to poverty. These are the Dominicans and right. the Franciscans right. that look, you know, suspiciously similar to the Albigensians and, you know, okay. and, the, and the Waldensians who, you know, they're, who are being routed out right now. But then you yeah. have these orders doing something very similar uh, right, and and they're looked down upon. 
Uh, there's criticism of the Franciscans, for example, because uh, healthy, able-bodied men should not be begging for their bread. They should be working for their food, right? right. Is a criticism yeah. that's leveled. So that's, a, that's another change that's going on at the time. And then third, and these are all interconnected, because of course the Dominicans yeah. and the Franciscans are teaching in the universities. Well, Saint Bonaventure would be a good example. Right? As we'll get yeah. to, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, you have the discovery of Aristotle, the rediscovery of Aristotle. Ah, yeah. You probably know a bit of that history. What do you kind of know about that? How would you summarize the rediscovery of Aristotle? Uh, who well, does he belong to before the Christians? When he's, uh, he's Greek. <laughs> okay. Well, he's, he's Greek. <laughs> yeah, he belongs to the Byzantines, right? I, don't know. I mean, uh, obviously it's through... Um, I mean, Islam expands rapidly, and by 638, uh, they've conquered uh, Jerusalem and subsumed it. It's not until 1453 that Constantinople falls. But through that interaction with the um, Byzantine world, uh, they come in contact with um, with Aristotle. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a circuitous route where... Uh, the, uh, Western scholars then, uh, mm. f- through Byzantium to Islam, yeah. to, to back, uh, and the Jewish yes. thinkers as well, but yes, uh, yes. back to the Western um, sphere, if you like, uh, of, of, of Europe, uh, the, the Arab Christendom, they uh, rediscover mm. uh, Aristotle. And mm, so yes. this mm. is um, a boon to uh, theology. And, of course, there's... Uh, and learning in general, uh, there, there's uh, sometimes a caricature that um, you know Aquinas is just um, expounding upon Aristotle. He's just continuing Aristotle, yeah. uh, you know, extrapolating a little bit. I, I've heard um, you know some political philosophers today say, "Well, you know, Aquinas says this, but let's let's just bypass Aquinas. Let's just go right back to Aristotle because you know mm-hmm. he's just echoing him anyhow." Yeah. As opposed to saying, "Well, actually." This is a language, a tool set, mm-hmm. like the the organon, right? That that Aristotle's going to give some tools mm-hmm. for thinking, and then th- uh, someone like Aquinas, be a good example, takes up these tools yeah. and runs with them in his own direction. Well, just like you said, Augustine baptizes Plato, and Plato looks different after that process. Absolutely, Aristotle's yeah. baptized by Aquinas, sure, yeah. but he looks different out as the outcome of yeah. that, right. and that had to happen because there is a lot in. Aristotle, that's very problematic. So Plato is not deeply interested, for, for obvious reasons, if yep. you know his philosophy, in like the material world and material sciences. That's just, I mean, it's not, right. to, say, not to say it's yeah. unimportant or whatever, but they are shadows, right? They're not the ultimate realities of the world, which are yep. immaterial and eternal. Arist- yeah. Aristotle um, couches this differently, right? He right. sees the forms as being present in the things themselves, and yes. consequently he, in a lot of ways... It's over again, oversimplified, but you could say he founds a lot of Western science, right? He writes books on physics, yeah. uh, a biology, lot of found, yeah, foundational texts on biology and so forth, embryology and all that. Yeah. Uh, and, and develops the theories about the four elements and so on. And in rediscovering those, and, and his method, his method is being very empirical mm-hmm. in, in the West, uh, sorry, in the East, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, that leads to a kind of scientific revolution. Uh, and mathematical revolution. There's, there's a great deal of uh, progress that's made scientifically and mathematically uh, among uh, Muslim scholars because they're studying uh, Aristotle. Um, you know, algebra, right? The, the Arabic names or algorithm. Right? You can, right. you can kind of hear the names of the Arab influences in those terms. Yeah. Now, the Muslim philosophers ended up moving away. Well, Muslim philosophy altogether becomes kind of abandoned. Right. Uh, and there's a step away from Aristotle because there is a lot in Aristotle that seems to contradict revealed religion. Mm-hmm. Famously, Aristotle thinks that the universe always existed. Uh, right. He believes in a first cause, actually, yep. which I have to explain to my students sometimes how, how he squares that circle. But he, he believes in God and the prime mover, yeah. but he, he thinks the prime mover has eternally been moving the universe. It, 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 the analogy would be like if you go to the beach and someone's standing there, they're making a footprint in that sand. Yeah. But they imagine they've eternally been standing on that beach. Mm-hmm. Right? So they're the cause of that footprint, but there was also never a time when the footprint didn't exist. That, mm-hmm. that would sort of be Aristotle's take on how God God exists and God is the cause of the universe, but the universe has eternally existed. That's obviously contradicts what Christianity and Islam teach, which is that God created the universe ex nihilo sure. yep. uh, and so forth. And there's other things where Aristotle just seems to... And, and again, his vision of the prime mover is like an indifferent being who couldn't who couldn't interact with us, right, right? and so yeah. forth. So, for these and other reasons, uh, Islam moves away from philosophy. They start seeing it as unhelpful, and uh, famously, Averroes right. comes up with this 
again, I, I imagine it's more complicated than this, but the, yeah. the caricature of it sure. is that there's a kind of dual truth theory, yeah. right? That in one sense you can say that material science gives us one kind of truth, and then revealed religion tells us a different kind of truth, and they seem to contradict, but somehow they're just both true, and we have to hold them in tension in some way. Yeah. Uh, which is picked up in the West, because then the West discovers Aristotle, sees a lot of value in Aristotle, but also recognizes that uh, if Aristotle lived today, he would be a heretic if he held these views. Right. So what do you do with that? And you yeah. get this kind of Christian of heroism that like Cesare of Brabant puts forward, and it's, it's a dual true theory, where yeah. somehow we need to keep, you know, we can believe all this stuff that Aristotle unearths, uh, but we can also somehow hold the truths of faith at the same time. Right, yeah. So we'll silo off Aristotle to have his own silo of truth and, and we'll have revealed basically some, as well. Yeah. Somehow we'll square that. And yeah. as we've talked about on this program before, uh, the church actually does condemn propositions of Aristotle. Uh, 1277 is a yeah. famous case of that. But the fact is that by, from what I've read, by 1255 in the universities, uh, if you wanted to pass your, you want to get your Master of Arts degree, you're examined on a bunch of books and almost the whole canon of Aristotle is in that list. Uh, right. Other than like his metaphysics, that was I think that one was off. But all of his stuff on physical science and logic, uh, you had to basically be conversant enough with to pass an exam on if you wanted to get your master of arts. So in the university, Aristotle like he wins that round, uh, which is why yeah. it's so important what Aquinas does in saying actually there's only one truth and there's a way of reconciling and correcting Aristotle, right, right. Uh, through the faith, but also seeing what he has that's legitimately true. Yeah. Um, that's very important. But that's that's the situation that Bonaventure comes into in right. a lot of ways, is that Aristotle, despite seeming to contradict the faith, standing on behalf of uh, autonomous, rational philosophy, has been basically embraced by the universities. Right. right. And this is seen as problematic in a lot of ways, uh, there are two because there's one approach to that which is what I've said before it's the dual truth theory and what that ends up doing is saying well really science philosophy it's autonomous from theology it's doing mm -hmm. theology should have nothing to do with science uh, and, with, yeah. and with the arts right, right. And, and and again there's a whole revision of the curriculum that's going on here right so uh, we've talked before uh, several times about the trivium and the quadrivium the trivium is the foundation for all the classical learning grammar logic and rhetoric. And then the quadrivium, the mathematical ones are arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Uh, and that, those are seen as, in that case, because now you have these classical sources that explain all those, well, they're just autonomous. You do science, you do the liberal arts, just autonomously from theology. Right. It's just a whole separate mm -hmm. discipline. Very influential view today, I'd say. Still held by a lot of people. You know, you can hold whatever religious sure. beliefs you want, but that has no bearing on, like, the sciences, right? right. Or on yeah. the secular disciplines. Yeah. Um, and in a way, that's taken up in the other direction uh, by some pious people who say, well, because of that, you should just cling to faith and not bother studying any of that. It was similar to what you said before about, you know, some, a lot of the attitude in the patristic era. is maybe there's some value, but it's probably best to even just stay away from all of that. Right. Keep away from learning almost altogether. Yep. Right, an attitude that keeps up, like I said, with Thomas Akempis, but uh, comes through in this new order called the Franciscans, right? Okay. Founded by St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, Francis himself, I mean, because the whole idea is it's poverty and it's humility. Right. And Francis himself, there's a story, he didn't want his brothers to even own books. Right, because yeah. they're Because of the risk that of, of pride that would come with that, right? The risk of you're superior to somebody else because you're smarter than them. Yeah. And even owning books, well, that kind of gives you a sense of proprietary attachment, right? Right, which is which is against that spirit of yeah. uh, utter poverty of spirit. Yeah. And books would be exceedingly expensive as well yes. in in that time. Absolutely, and 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 he, I mean, there's a story about one brother who said, "Look, can I just own like a little psalm book, just a psalter that I can pray with?" Yeah. And at first, Francis reluctantly said yes, but then he actually took it back and said, <laughs> "No, no, because if you if you own a psalter, soon you'll want a breviary." And then you'll, and then you'll, you will sit in a big chair and demand to your brothers, bring me my breviary. Yeah, yeah. And he picked, and he picks up ashes, Francis, and yeah. sprinkles them on his forehead and says, "Behold, I a breviary." Uh. And I mean, it sounds you get, you know, but yeah. there's something to. I mean, we were both sort of academics. There's something to that, right? About the pride that comes with that, and the sense of like, 
finding your worth in your output and you know what I mean and, and in what you can do uh, and the ownership right like you you want your own little library of books that right. you get tense when somebody takes your books without asking or something sure. right can, can, can you like sign this article I just published right. uh, or, or, case, or, or, case in point yeah. yes exactly or maybe I should sign it but, um, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, okay. so not that Francis thought no it's, Francis didn't forbid it altogether because St. Anthony of Padua did ask mm. uh, well he wanted his brothers to preach Right. And eventually there comes a point, well, you need some education for that. Right. So he did tell um, St. Anthony of Padua um, that he could teach. He said, it is my wish that you teach the brethren sacred theology, yet in such a manner as not to extinguish in thyself and others the spirit of prayer and devotion, according as it is prescribed in the rule. So he did say, look, you can learn theology, you can study and be an academic, but don't right. extinguish the spirit of piety. Okay. Sort of books allowed for St. Anthony at that well, point? Well, at that point, it seems like you have to make some concessions, right? So so basically, the how, then the question is, how do you make that work? And into that comes a guy named St. Bonaventure, who you've okay. never heard of before today. Yeah. So I guess I have to fill you in on this. He was uh, a Dominican, right? He's a <laughs> oh, wait, sorry. Oh, man, no, millions that's... of voices cried out in pain. <laughs> <laughs> in the, I, I it's just, a great disturbance okay. in the voice. <laughs> I can feel it from the friary, from Newman Theological College, the ripples. We had some wonderful instructors that we worked we with at, yeah. at uh, Newman Theological College who are Bonaventure experts uh, and right. Franciscans. Uh, Bonaventure is considered the second founder of the Franciscans because he became the uh, superior general of the order. Uh, there's a proper term for that, but right. he, he takes over eventually. And he's interesting because he becomes a Franciscan after he gets his Masters of Arts. Uh. So he's an academic who becomes a Franciscan. And he is an, he's very enamored with St. Francis out the idea of, of his sanctity. Um, but he also believes it is possible. You've got to be careful, but it is possible. Well, here's the thing. Most of us aren't St. Francis. So most of us have to get to where he was in some way by study. Study has to play a role in that. So Francis, you know, he has his vision of the crucified seraph, the angel with six wings. Mm -hmm. And after that vision, he had experiences the stigmata, yeah. which is the wounds of Christ that he has. And then he writes the Canticle of the Creatures. Mm -hmm. where he's able to see Christ in everything in creation, uh, in, the, in the heat and light of Brother Sun, right, in the coolness of Sister Moon, right? Yeah. Most of us, Bonaventure thinks, need to kind of study to get there. Right. Um, but he does believe, Bonaventure is known as the last great Platonist. Okay. Uh, he's, he's not a fan of Aristotle, though he's able to use Aristotle. But the idea that God has created the whole world according to these exemplars in his mind. Right. That means that everything in creation is a vestige of the Trinity. And vestige here means footprint or footstep, right? Mm -hmm. Everything has some similarity to God because it proceeded from him. And therefore, through contemplation of the world, we can actually be led back to God. Right. And, and not just yeah. to God by like, oh, we'll intellectually be persuaded of him or something, but into charity, like into union of the soul with God. Right. And... Uh, in fact, and this is what we can essentially retrace the route of St. Francis through academics and through contemplation of the created world. Right? And his famous book on this is called The Mind's Journey into God, uh, but he also had a uh, vision for the university of how this could be done. Because he becomes, he gets the chair of Matt, there's a Franciscan seat in theology at the University of Paris, and he gets it, and his inaugural sermon or speech is this text, or at least right. it's taken from this, called on the reduction of the arts to theology. He's doing a couple of things here. On the one hand, he's responding to those who say that uh, the arts shouldn't be studied by Christians. He's going to say, no, in fact, those can be all retraced back to God, and you can see God in all of them. So they're valuable to be studied to that end. Yeah. But he's also responding to those who say they're autonomous, and he's saying, no, 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 actually all of these are in some sense a subset of theology. They have right. their own autonomy, okay. but you can't actually fully understand them apart from theology. So he's coming up with his own university curriculum. He's kind of doing something similar to what John Henry Newman would later do in his book, The Idea of a University, mm. by saying that the university actually finds its meaning and purpose if it's centered on theology. Right. And, he, and, uh, and, and leads the mind of the student back to God. Yeah. So uh, yeah. That is a, that's the 25-minute lead-up to discussing okay. it. But do you have any comments or questions before we kind of get into the text itself? Uh, no, I mean that that uh, seems, like, it seems like a very um, well laid out playing field. I mean, obviously, you can jump ahead to later thinkers in the modern era where uh, theology and other disciplines will bifurcate. Uh, thinking in particular of Kant, for example. Yeah. Uh, and their um, 
ethics then becomes foundational to the point where um, subsequent thinkers following his train will uh, develop their theology based on ethics. Uh, yeah. So it's almost, mm-hmm. um, I guess maybe none of that similar from Thomas Akempis. Uh, yeah. Right, where uh, you um, can relegate its works first and then thought later, uh, essentially. And, and from yeah. those, from an ethical system, then you derive your theology. It is is the corollary of, of Kant's system, his kingdom of ends and so on. Um, yeah. So this, this mm-hmm. is not a... Um, scholastic debate per se uh, mm-hmm. but one I think that is perennial in, in the um, Christian tradition right? yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a really great point and, and of course it's, it's what happened in Islam right where's the idea that well speculating on this doesn't matter because everything you need to know is in the Quran right. so really you should yeah. put your efforts into serving others which is why there becomes a very strong tradition of Islamic jurisprudence right. uh, Islamic medical science like to this day right there's a lot of uh, Muslim doctors right and nurses and that's because of the thought is, well, you got to focus your mind on what's practical because yeah. because the philosophical speculation will just take you away from God and away from what God has revealed. Right. Uh, and Ivanovich is going to say the exact opposite is the case. Um, yeah. And uh, that Kant is completely misguided about this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, should, I, I don't know if I should, I guess I should mention this now. It's really worth saying Bonaventure himself, you know, even though I'm saying he, he thinks you need to study to get to the point of Francis of Assisi, um, He's very saintly himself. In addition to having uh, an Aquinas level intellect, I mean, yeah. Dante puts them together, right? In Paradise, right. the two of them are yeah. together. You know, Aquinas is praising uh, Francis, and yes. Bonaventure is praising yeah. Dominic, and there's a yeah. there's a message there for us. Yeah. Uh, and there there's similar. Some of these may be uh, apocryphal, but there's lots of stories about the two of them, Aquinas and Bonaventure. Um, one is that you know Aquinas wrote the liturgy for Corpus Christi. Right. The story goes that Bonaventure and Aquinas were both asked to write a liturgy for Corpus Christi. And yeah. they both went up to the Pope, and Aquinas went first and read his. And as he did so, Bonaventure broke down in tears and tore up his own. <laughs> said, you, yeah. you, you don't need this anymore. Go with yeah. Aquinas. Yeah. But similarly, there's a story where Aquinas went, he wanted to visit Bonaventure. And Bonaventure at the yeah. time was working on the life of St. Francis, okay. uh, which became the actual official biography of St. Francis of Assisi. And as he approached, as Aquinas approached Bonaventure's cell, as he's working on this biography, the holiness that was radiating from it was so strong that Aquinas yeah. actually said, "Let's let's leave him alone. Let's leave a saint to the work of a saint." Right. And so there's this yeah. great. I mean, the tradition of the church is that there's this really yeah. great reverence between the two of them. And and just like Aquinas, there's the story about his confessor saying that he has the sins of a child of five. Uh, there's a similar thing about the, the teacher of Bonaventure was Alexander of Hales, and he apparently once said that somehow Bonaventure seemed untouched by Adam's sin. Okay. So there is a great sanctity as well as a great intellect there. Yeah. The difference is that Bonaventure is busy running the order, whereas Aquinas yeah. isn't. Aquinas doesn't have any administrative positions that I'm aware of. So yeah. he's able to write the Summa, of course, and there's nothing yeah. of that size and breadth in uh, Bonaventure. Uh, but I would say that you can sense a, a, an intellect no less great than Aquinas right. is in his work, even in a little text like this. Yeah. So first of all, on the reduction of the arts to theology, it's worth noting, so I'm a Latin teacher, reduction here doesn't mean, like, shrinking. Oh, you know? okay. Um, so what does it mean? Well, so re, the prefix re does mean, you know, to go back. Okay. We're all familiar with this. Yeah. But deuce is from uh, ducere, which is mm, to lead. Right. So we got duke from yeah. that, or ducal. Uh, but you think of uh, abduct. Right. right. You're taking someone somewhere. Oh. Uh, or... Um, to educate, right? ah, to take yes. someone out, or um, I actually went and I looked up a whole bunch of examples of our language where we use this. But uh, if you think of like even um, seduce, right, is to lead a certain way, or oh, a dock. The word dock actually comes from the same root, so it's like okay. where the ship comes in, or right. to introduce, or produce, uh, or conduct. They're uh, all about kind of like leading in a certain direction, yeah, right? right? So to reduce, I, I've seen this. I, I like this translation better, actually. The retracing, retracing of the arts to theology. Yeah, of the. I mean, literally. I mean, literally. Like, the, the, yeah. the treachery of translation, right? It, it, it'd literally be like the re the leading back of arts to theology. I guess you could okay. say. Uh, but that's what he's trying to say. He's not saying, you know, if you if you trim it down, it's actually all theology because he does recognize it's a nature grace thing. There is a difference between theology and these arts, but they all ultimately lead back to theology. Right. If you understand them properly, and again, he's doing this as a 
as a speech at a university, you know. Uh, so <laughs> everyone who's present is listening to him and should see themselves in it. So I'm going to do my best as I explain this. And it's, it's a brief text, but it's dense, so obviously I'm going to have to summarize uh, and skim over things. And let me know if I'm ever getting too arcane. You just cut me right off at the hips there, and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Yeah. But I'll try to connect this to, in case there are any teachers listening at classical Catholic schools, right. uh, or any Catholic uh, school, uh, to what I think are kind of the modern equivalents of uh, these uh, subjects that he's talking about. I've, I have my own uh, bullet point list yeah. there for you, as well as we've got the text here. But let's start with, he roots this all in the creation week, which he does again in the last text he was working on at the end of his life. Uh, his uh, collations on the Hexameron, I think is what it's called. Uh, he, those are also reflections on the six days of creation. He didn't get to finish that one because he was made a cardinal archbishop and presided over the uh, yeah presided over the Council of Lyon, the Second Council of uh, Lyon, I think. So, so I'll go over this as quickly as I can. So, there are six days of creation. Yeah? Okay. Then the the first day of creation. God creates light. Now, think about it. Right. You need light for all the days. Mm -hmm. So the light of the first day is actually going to inform the lights of all the other days. He says the first day of creation is theology, sacred ah. scripture. Now, we've talked about this before, but there's a <laughs> yes. literal sense of scripture, and then there's the three allegorical senses of, or the three spiritual senses of scripture. Right? Yes. Uh, there's the allegorical, the moral, and the anagogical. Now, he, from that, infers... Uh, that there's basically three things that theology is teaching us. One is about what to be believed, which is the generation and procession of the word. So like the uh -huh. eternal generation of the second person of the Trinity, and yeah. uh, I mean his incarnation. What, to, what we need to believe, the speculative right. aspect of okay. theology. Then there's the moral life. So then there's the pattern of life. Okay. Um, and that is the practical aspect of theology. This was a common thing of the time, right? Is, is yeah. theology a speculative science or a practical science? Right. He says it's, it's both. It's actually a third thing. And ah. the third thing is the, the union of the soul with God, the anagogical sense of mm. uh, scripture. And he says that right. it's the affective part. And he says that theology is ultimately an affective science. It combines this practical ah. and the speculative. So that's, that's uh, theology, and uh, that's the first light, the light mm -hmm. of the first day. Okay. Then the second day, you could say, oh, yeah, I didn't put it in the, quite this order, but he's starting with the lower and going upper. Uh, is the, uh, the light of sense knowledge. Okay, so... Uh, that's the inferior light. So we're able to perceive things through our senses. That's, that's the, uh, an inferior light. And he says, here's the analogy to those three things that theology teaches. First of all, sense perception. You are uh, hearing our voices right now in your ears. That's a sense perception. Yeah. That has some analogy to us. Oh. Right? Analogy to uh, my own voice box and the sounds coming out of my right. voice. Uh, or you're looking at something right now. You're maybe looking at the screen and there's light bouncing off of the screen into your eyes or emanating off the screen into your eyes. We're looking at each other and the light's bouncing off each other. What Those colors and uh, shapes that we see have an analogy to the person we're looking at. Right? He says that that is analogous to the word being begotten from all eternity. The, the word that proceeds from the Father has a similarity to the Father and, re, and a resemblance to the Father. That's very similar to what's happening in sense perception. So there's the generation and incarnation mm. of the Son right there. Okay. First part. Yep. Uh, then he says, senses act with regard to their proper object, right? So your eyes don't taste anything. If you pour soup right. into your eyes, you won't taste it through oh, your eyes. No. They will, they'll resist that, right? Yeah. Uh, you can't uh, smell colors, right? Is it, you know, much as we sometimes you know, talk as though we can. So mm -hmm. he says, the senses go towards what's proper to them and they avoid what is not proper to them. Okay. That's an image of the moral life. We should go towards what's good for us and avoid what's bad for us. Yeah. So there's that moral lesson. And then thirdly, there's a delight, right? Your senses delight in receiving. There's, there's a kind of, analogous to that kind of joy, right? You, you get annoyed if you have uh, dirty glasses. You want them, when, once they're cleaned and you can see things again, there's something pleasurable about that. Right, right? yeah. In the same way, the soul delights in its proper object, which is when it's united uh, to God. Right. So right there, sense, ob sense perception, the inferior light of knowledge, uh, has an analogy to these the three senses of scripture, the three things that theology, te spiritual senses, the three things theology is teaching us are all revealed and, and we properly understand what's going on in sense knowledge through theology. So the, right away, that, that should give you a sense of what he's going to be doing in this little text, you know, yeah. about how these other, so this light for the second day comes from the light of the first day of theology. Oh, okay. 
Now, second, uh, or the third day, I guess we could say, the exterior light. That's the mechanical arts. That's the production of artifacts. And I won't go through all... So he gives the seven uh, mechanical arts that Hugh of St. Victor identified, um, which maybe I can go through super quickly. There's weaving, armor-making, farming, hunting, navigation, medicine, and the dramatics. And the dramatics is anything that's like songs, novel writing, stuff we'd cover in the fine arts right. or in literature class. Yeah. Uh, armor-making yeah. is... A, any kind of production of instruments of stone or wood. So, like, if you're in a mechanical arts class of any kind, like shop class or okay. welding, that would be a case of that. Yeah. And uh, hunting, he says, actually, that's any kind of preparing food. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. He says it's called hunting because hunting is noblest, right? It's what they right. do in the courts. Yeah. But uh, So, foods class. Um, and then navigation. He actually says that's getting people to wear what they need. Okay. So, he actually says the art of selling and buying. Is oh, under navigation. Okay. So if you're in economics class or business class, that would be that. Those are all the mechanical arts. Right. So in the production of artifacts, okay, they first of all, those all proceed from an idea in your mind. You have the idea of a cake you really want to bake, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then yeah. you build something. I'm sure you right away, as soon as I incepted that in your mind, you wanted to bake a cake. Yes. Well, there's an analogy to the generation and incarnation of the word, right? Oh. Eternally, the word proceeds from the Father. It's, a, it's an image of what's in his mind, which right. is the, the self-conception. Yeah. So anytime we create, that's a kind of imitation of what's going on eternally in the Trinity. Right? Now, he also says that uh, every artisan wants to make something that's beautiful, useful, and enduring. Well, that's also actually the nature of the moral life. Right, we need to be persevering. Like you, you build something, you don't want it to fall apart right away. Same way, more morally, we want to persevere, and we want to be useful to others, and we want to live kind of a beautiful, exemplary life. So, right. actually, in the production of something that's beautiful and lasting and useful, there's yeah. an image of the moral life in that. Okay. Uh, and also, ultimately, be over and above that, uh, the artisan wants to make something that gives pleasure. That's delightful. That right and gets mm. and get praise for. I mean, you could say, well, isn't that egotistical? But in a in a healthy, legitimate sense, right. they want something that's praise worthy. Yeah. That they're going to produce um, that, that 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 intrinsically deserves praise, and that uh, that delight. Well, he what Juan Adventure says is that the reason that God made the soul rational is so that it can praise, serve, and find delight in God, in the union with God with the soul. Right. That's what union of God with the soul actually means. Okay. That we praise delight and serve god just like we want to build you know someone wants to build a mug or a microphone or a computer yeah. they want it to be something that uh serves you and uh is Delights useful to you, you and, yeah. and brings you delight because you're yeah. oh man we like today when we were when we tested the microphone immediately we were like oh our voices sound good on this right yeah so yeah. it's a quality instrument right right so again the mechanical arts all reveal theology they can be retraced back to theology yes now, does that make sense? What do you think of that? Yeah, um, I do detect a, a danger here. Um, I mean, maybe it's misplaced, but weaving all threads back to theology uh, can distract sometimes from weaving all threads. All, all threads back to theos, right? Hmm. So, so whereas. Um, yeah, I'm not saying this is what Bonaventure is going to do, but um, it. it as opposed, right? So, so it's it's leading back to this discipline, as opposed to leading back to the divine. Wow. Right? Well, bear with me. Let's oh, see. Let's okay. see if he responds to that. Yeah, uh, because I'd love then, to hear that. well, what he says is, well, first of all, he does he does this thing that it's. You know, well, the reason why I bring that up is, uh, I mean, for Plato's Republic, right? Mm. Uh, well, who's going to lead the Republic? Ah. It's going to be. <laughs> get this yeah yeah it's the be philosophers the, the guys reading this book so, sure, yes the guys writing that and reading this book uh so is a theologian okay i mean that's i'm trained as a theologian but uh sure. so so it's it's uh, the danger then would be uh all things come back to well to me right um now again i'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not saying oh, interesting. At well, all sure, that right, that's but, what he's arguing but I, you can see that as a danger latent mm-hmm. in that type of system I think, I think that is why for him it's so key to say though that you you can't just be see aquinas actually says that theology is a speculative science but bonaventure and right. he's, he's with most of the medieval psalmists aquinas is kind of an outlier of saying no it's something bigger than that it can't just be speculative it can't just be the stuff that uh, St. Anthony's doing. I mean, again, for right. him, the ideal is someone like St. Francis, who he writes the biography of. And yeah. the mind's journey into God is actually a reflection on that, that, that the vision that 
Francis had of the seraph, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. The six wings of the seraph are actually the six ways, to, just like there's six ways to God here. Mm-hmm. And, and he says the lower um, wings that are touching the earth, they yeah. start, you, know, you contemplate the lower things, right. and you contemplate the invisible things like our soul. And then from there, you actually go to God himself. And that's supposed to be the goal, is the, something like what Francis underwent. He, he writes the mind's journey into God at the actual location where uh, Francis underwent the stigmata. And he's inviting us actually to go through that process too. And in fact, that's where we've gotten in here, actually. The first, yeah. the first two that we talked about are the external things, the physical, you know, the sense, perception, and mechanical arts. Uh, the next three are all going to be interior. Right. Um, and there's a reason he's talking about the six days of creation. Because um, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get to that. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll try to plug to the end here, and then I'll see if this answers your question. Or unless there's something right away. Well, well I can just anticipate Descartes' um, you know, extension thought, right? Mm-hmm. Where um, if you're going to bifurcate or or think of you know francis is the spiritual who um has this enlightenment of his soul it's it's revealed to him right Mm -hmm. Uh, right this is not uh, a bottom-up natural philosophy that he's embarking on uh but this is a mystical vision which he's been by grace Mm -hmm. given right yes uh as opposed to bonaventure saying hey let's embark on this intellectual pursuit mm-hmm. uh, books and so on which are going to then that's what we need to get to um, mm-hmm. the theos right uh, so so at, where so Descartes will will bifurcate that radically where those don't really interact um, mm-hmm. in that sense whereas I think Bonaventure is giving a path for both of those to be held together mm-hmm. so we're not saying um, look Francis got this this, sure, this spiritual yes. vision enlightenment um, the rest of us poor saps. Well, uh, we have to right, use our yes. intellect mm-hmm. as as oars to to reach to, uh, higher mm-hmm. up. Because because I mean, for Descartes, that that's what it's going to be. It's going to be the intellect, mm-hmm. uh, which which gets us there. It's not the body, right? Right. Or the yes. praxis mm-hmm. of 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 exercise. Right. Right. right yes. Um, well, I think, and also what he's doing is saying, first we see God through things, then we see God in things, and then we can see God himself, right? This is the whole part of, of this is very, I think, anti-Cartesian, saying, yeah. no, actually, the world is full of vestiges of the Trinity, yes. so you should actually be looking at the world first, right? Not withdrawing into yourself. You're right, right? But yes. But going outwards into yourself. Now, that yeah. being said, after having looked at the external world, then you go into the uh, the three interior lights. In one, in one way, he says there's four lights. Oh, okay. uh, he says there's a superior light, the inferior light, the exterior light, and then the interior light. But then he s- splits that into three so that you can have the six days. Right? Oh, okay, nice. So then there's rational philosophy, natural philosophy, and moral philosophy. So let's go through those quickly. Rational philosophy, that's where you have the grammar, logic, and rhetoric. How, how do you be uh, a rational and communicative person? First of all, if you're learning how to speak, and this, you know, this is actually something, if, you know, if you do Toastmasters or something, there's a right. bit of that. Uh, certainly English language arts, right? It's a communication, uh, especially the humanities, but really any class. There's, part of it is communicating effectively. Some people yeah. say that every class is a language arts class, right? Because you're learning how to communicate. Yeah. So first of all, there's always a person speaking, and they're communicating an idea that's, they're, 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 what they're trying to say has to correspond to an idea that's in their own mind. Once again, that's an analogy to the eternal procession of the sun. And ultimately do the incarnation, too, because there's a, that, that's all been represented in created form, right? Right, yeah. uh, Just like uh, our, our words in our mind take on, they clothe themselves in voice, as Bonaventure yes. puts it. Yeah. Uh, the mind, the word of God clothes itself in, uh, in the human nature. Uh, yeah. Then there's delivery of speech. There should be fittingness, truth, and style, right? Uh, just like our actions should be characterized by modesty, uh, beauty, which is like purity, and then order, like a rightness of intention. So fittingness, truth, and style uh, correspond to measure, beauty, and order, modesty, purity, and rightness of intention. That's the pattern of life. We have to act in a moral way, right? Okay. Just, yeah. uh, fittingly, and you could say, and beautifully. And then the purpose of speech um, is to in- in- express, instruct, and persuade. And in some sense, that can only happen if you are influencing the soul of your student, Right. In some way, you're oh. making contact with the soul of your student, right? Okay. It has to be landing, right? Wow. Uh, you have to yeah. be getting there with your student. No yeah. like we use these kind of idioms as teachers. Like, oh, I don't know if I really like, you know, if it really hit these students, what yes. I was saying. Right? But yeah. if you make that contact, that's when actual effective rhetoric, or you could say, like, the speaker moved me. Right. But well, think of the image there, right? Yeah. It's, like, it's like you've been touched. You've been affected in yeah. some way. Well, that is the union of the soul of God. Ultimately, right. like it's got to be that God has moved you. He's reached out and touched you. Right? Right. And, and then, and again, in an effective lesson or speech, you're not just moved, but you're empowered in some way. 
right. which is also what the union of the soul with God should be. It gives you a new kind of grace, right? Okay. So there's an image of that in the... And then he also goes into, I'll just throw this out there, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, he thinks corresponds to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay. Uh, grammar is like the essence of things themselves, the Father. Uh, okay. Logic is like, you know, the logos. Right? Sure. And okay. then uh, rhetoric is about moving you. Oh, and okay. stuff. That's yeah. the Holy Spirit. Right. That's, that will come up again. Because then in yeah. natural philosophy, that's about knowing the essences of things themselves. So uh, there's forms in things, right? Well, and that's and that's how things are intelligible to us, and then we sort of learn them in our own minds, and we get forms yeah. in our own minds. Well, the exemplar for all of that is the logos, the source of all forms, which is okay. in, which is eternally in the mind of the Father. Um, right. Okay. Oh, and uh, then further on, <laughs> this is where he gets into the science of the time, which is still basically correct. Um, so natural philosophy again. The sun, the moon, and the stars are sending forth power and virtue, right? On okay. the earth, and that's what makes it fertile. All right. right? Um, and he says that corresponds to Christ and Mary and the saints, right? The, the oh. sun, the moon, and the stars, right? Yeah. Are sending down power to us. And, oh, I see. Right? Yeah. And I mean, if you look at our biology, like our, I think it's grade seven biology in Alberta, yeah. uh, a lot of it is how does energy go through an ecosystem? Right. Well, that energy all comes from the sun. So in some ways, yeah. like it's still fundamentally there. And Bonaventure was also had a great devotion to Mary as well, I should mention. So again, that there's the pattern of human life. That's more, for him, that's actually morality. Right. Okay. Is that grace comes down from above and empowers us to be fruitful. Right. right. Uh, and then uh, he has this interesting thing about, okay, how, how does a human, again, in biology, how is a soul united to the body? And this isn't like mm -hmm. in a Cartesian way of like, you know, this right. is plugged into the pineal gland. Yeah. But basically, like, when something's alive, what's keeping it alive? What's uniting the living soul to the material corporal body? And he says, basically, like, you need warmth, breath, and moisture. Okay. If you think about it, like a corpse, you know, you, yeah. you, get, you die if you're, de you, if you're dehydrated or if you're too cold or if yeah. you can't breathe, you die. Right. Right. And he allegorizes this. He says moisture is like the tears of compunction, okay. right? repentance, breath, well, the spirit, right? You need the spirit of God yeah. and then warmth. And that's desire for, for God. Yeah. Right. You need that warm burning. Okay. Desire, like Augustine, like right? You yes. know, our heart's burning with, you know, within us kind of that's a thing. A, well, yeah. so again, uh, biology itself is pointing to the union of the soul of God. Right, the anagogical meaning. Okay. The, the anagogical meaning of it. Oh, I like it. Um, yeah, yeah. As we close in on the end of this episode, we can pick this up in future episodes if you want. We can do a sequel to this and to talk about this more. But sure. I will say, too, again, natural philosophy, metaphysics, mathematics, and physics. Metaphysics is the father. Mathematics is the son. Physics is the Holy Spirit. Because physics has to deal with emotion, emotion yeah. things, yeah. right? Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's what moves us. And yeah. then, uh, finally, the interior light is moral philosophy. And you might think this speaks for itself, but he does parse it because he says... Moral philosophy deals with justice, which uh, I think Anselm defines as the rectitude of the will. So he goes down and he talks about what it means to have rectitude, rightness, straightness. Mm. They have a ruler. It's from the same, right? a well, regulator, to, right? Or to be so justified, he, right? Well, sure, exactly. Yeah. yeah, to be justified, like right justified, you have to be straight. So he says a ruler, like a straight line, has two points and a thing in the middle, like the Trinity. Ah, <laughs> right, okay. the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in between them. Go back and listen to our episode on the Trinity for right. that. Sure, yeah. So again, there's... The eternal generation of the sun shows through there. Uh, then rectitude, again, um, somebody's got to measure up to the ruler that's measuring yeah. it, to the straightness. Yeah. That's the moral life. We follow the law of God. And then finally, uh, we are created upright as human beings. Right? We're oh. created straight. Okay. Right? Yeah. So that, he says that's a message that our, our heads, our minds, our rationality points upwards and finds its completion up in God. Ah. So rectitude is, is, is built into us biologically in some way. Okay. That rectitude symbolizes ultimately the union of the soul with God. Now, okay. looking at the time, I'll conclude with this. These are six days. Those each have a morning and an evening because all knowledge will come to an end. Oh. Right? First Corinthians 13, right? Oh, right? When that which is perfect has come. Right? Yes. We, we only know in part. When that which is perfect has come... Uh, that which we only know in part will come to an end. All this knowledge will in some sense cease because it will be fulfilled in the light of the seventh day, which uh, is ultimately contemplation, infused contemplation, and then finally the beatific vision, right? right. which has no evening or morning in Genesis, right? right? It's yes. eternal. Like Hebrews talks about this, yeah. you know, but the Sabbath day never ends. Yeah, well, so, the, the eighth day. Right? Well, and then, yeah. well, and then yeah. ultimately you get the eighth day as well, yeah. right? It, which the scripture fleshes out. So I think just in response to your earlier thing about, well, is this all kind of intellectual... I think for Bonaventure, the, here's where it concludes. No, it's all supposed to lead, all these six days, including theology, like as a discipline, yep. lead into the seventh day, right. which is the eternal day, the contemplation day, where we rest. We're not doing any work at that point. It's right. all God. And that's the goal of all this academics. That's the value right. of studying 
the arts, the classical arts, having an education, contemplation of the created things, contemplation of philosophy, ultimately f- reduces back yeah. to God's uh, revelation of himself. So that's Bonaventure's uh, vision of classical education, and I would say that's, that's why I call him the father of integration. <laughs> the way okay. He integrates yes. every, faith into everything and integrates everything into faith. So um, I know you have a deadline, but did you want to conclude in the last next three minutes? Did you want to kind of react to this at all? Well, we can pick up on this in a future episode. Well, I mean, or... it, it resonates strongly with, uh, and I mean, not, we mentioned um, the mystical experience of St. Francis, but also think of St. Thomas Aquinas. Right, uh, and his yeah. expression, you know, all is straw, all straw right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, he, despite his great system, which is very reasonable, mm-hmm. uh, and, and rooted in uh, erudition, uh, it's very erudite and so mm-hmm. on. Uh, yeah, this is what it all points towards, is yeah. participation in the mm-hmm. divine. Uh, and, and so that, that, I guess that's a reduction of a sort, uh, retracing yeah. us back to what our hearts are designed for, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what every fabric in our being is oriented towards ultimately if, if we love things rightly, right? Rightly, uh, yes. It, 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 right. In, in a nice straight line. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so that is um, education then becomes salvific, right? Uh, yeah. In, mm-hmm. in, that, in that sense where yeah. we, we are uh, realigning uh, our downward vision uh, or to the extent that it is disoriented, right, uh, back towards uh, that which continually beckons our hearts, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and, that, and that's a twofold thing, right? There, there's a there's a speculative element to that. Like you do have to reframe your thinking about these things, which is part of what Bonaventure wants to do. He wants to show actually you can't understand any of this without theology, You're right. not presupposing it, but that's ultimately affective. Right? Yes. It's also going to go to this practical thing as well of, then, yeah. okay, are you then stepping into love, into charity? He talks about charity as well in here. Right. Um, into that poverty of spirit. Right. right. Because, we, well, and again, going back to our earlier discussion with the Platonists and, and Augustine, it's like, well, we have to know where we're going. Yeah. Right. But the way we get there is through love. Yeah, through love. Right. Through right. imitation of Christ. Yeah. The double love, right? Absolutely. Love of God and, and love of neighbor. So. So, anyways, I hope this was helpful yep. to listeners yep. uh, and to you, Scholar from Clarny. So, do you Absolutely. want to close us in prayer? Absolutely. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. St. Bonaventure, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.